if they could just make me a trust fund baby, that would be great. I mean, if, if I all the artists that were, were able to become trust fund babies, <laughs> that would be pretty good. <laughs> yeah. What school do you go to for that? <laughs> I, I'm more of like hoping there's a button I can push. Yeah. yeah. Flip that little switch. Yeah. Or an app I can download. And <laughs> yeah. much- the financial security <laughs> app. <and> turn <laughs> it on. <laughs> I don't know what side effects there are, like sleepiness or explosive diarrhea. But yeah. yeah. I'm willing to take that on. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Waiting to Dry. It's very relaxing and soulful in the studio today. We have Sergio Lopez as your main host. Josh Lawyer. <laughs> and today we have David Polk on the podcast today. Hey, guys. Oh, yeah. Thanks for doing this, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're here in uh, your studio, Fault Line. Uh, yeah, you're you're uh, one of the few uh, gall- or studios where... You're kind of part of like this huge entity, you know, and you're where you're next to other artists and uh but yeah, it's a cool spot. I've never been before, but yeah, thanks for having us here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, uh for sure. Uh you Oakless based artist. Oak Oakless. Oakless. <laughs> you wanna start over now? <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah, uh I've been following your work for I feel like for a couple of years now. I don't know how I stumbled upon it, but really cool stuff. Um, yeah, and are you Bay Area native or? No, I was born and raised in New Mexico. Oh, New Mexico. Uh, wow. Yeah, grew up nice. in southern New Mexico and then went to Albuquerque for mm-hmm. school at UNM and then moved out here about almost eight years ago. UNM? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, did you go there for art? Or? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. How was that? It was good. I mean, it's a state school, so mm-hmm. it's not like a really fancy art <laughs> program, but, you know. Yeah, had the space to get work done. Mm. Actually, their art history department is really good, so oh. being able to take advantage of that was really cool. Nice, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, are you into art history in that way? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting thing to kind of learn the context that work was being made in. Mm, um, sure. I also love all those like super juicy life details about artists. Oh, like, do all you? The <laughs> stuff. That's uh, okay. Fun too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Sergio is very similar in that way. <laughs> I guess so. Um, not as much into the gossip, probably. <laughs> but Well, like backstory, aren't you super into that? Mm, depends. Like, I don't go out of my way to, to learn it, though, actually. Nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> so we started lying. Uh, but uh, that's cool. So you said you, so you majored in art and you did art history. Mm-hmm. That's cool. I'm, I'm the, probably the opposite of... Art history and me are like, um, I'm like a blank slate. Yeah. Slowly learning through this podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. For me, it was always like, I mean, I've talked about this before, but it's always been like a, a thing where I've kind of wanted to, you know, it's like, especially when you're young, you're like, I want to, I want to be my own artist. I want to be my own thing. I want to be original. I want to be. And so I was, you know, I'm, I'm a bit obsessed with that idea. I mean, not so much nowadays, but when I was younger. So I think uh, that, that uh, was kind of a thing for me as far as art history, but you know, I don't know, in some ways I, it's interesting now when I learn things, I'm like, Oh, that's cool. But <laughs> I mean, part of it was like just requirements for my major. Right. Cause the BFA program I took required a higher level of art history courses than mm-hmm. like a normal bachelor of arts. And so I basically got a minor in art history without actually getting a minor. That's cool. Um, yeah, there was a lot of really great instructors at UNM in that department. So for sure, cool. awesome. And then, so after that, you you moved down this way. Is that mm-hmm. how it worked? Well, I kicked around Albuquerque for another three years after <laughs> graduation. the The joke about New Mexico is the land of entrapment. The state motto is the land of enchantment. But oh. it's really <laughs> easy to get stuck there. So, uh, yeah. Is there? Is it? Uh, uh, what's the reason for that? Uh, it's cheap. It's slow. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's kind of easy to just sort of fall into this like lull, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. I grew up in, or I went to high school in a small town. It seems very similar. Yeah. You kind of get forced to find a job and then 
you make so little money because it's so small and rent is so cheap there that moving somewhere outside of that is like, like I have to pay how much for what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's cool. What brought you here? Um, I was looking for just more opportunity in the arts, mm -hmm. um, a more kind of active and engaged art community. I think Albuquerque is a really great place to go and chill and focus on your work. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's not as much of an art scene there. Um, mm. That has been changing a lot in the past few years. But when I was there, it just felt like you could kind of see the upper limits of that world. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I'm going to like be hitting the ceiling pretty soon here. Push your mic. Some editing for Sergio. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so you, you came to Oakland. It was were you was the idea to like kind of i know like san francisco when you talk about the bay area for a lot of people outside of the bay area it's like san francisco mm -hmm. you know and and maybe oakland is i mean oakland and san jose they kind of have somewhat of a presence but it seems like i don't know it's like in destination to san francisco for people a lot of times it seems like like oakland could be an hour, five hours from yeah. San Francisco. They have no mm -hmm. concept of, you know, what th this area is. I don't know if was San Francisco kind of like the destination place or were you, or was Oakland kind of like, oh, that seems like a. You know, I was just kind of like running through the list of places that I wanted, I was thinking about moving to. Mm -hmm. I was initially floating the idea of Philadelphia, but uh -huh. I just mm -hmm. didn't want to do East Coast winters. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> or summers for that matter. Yeah. yeah. They got to fix that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I was like, okay, I'll just come out here and check it out. I kind of wasn't really thinking about San Francisco at that point. I figured it was already too overpriced and oversaturated. Uh -huh. um, but I spent a week in Oakland and was like, yeah, I can do this. Like, it's right. a, It felt comfortable. I like that there's a little more room to breathe out here mm -hmm. versus the city, which is so crammed together. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. That's cool. I, I like Oakland. I wish I could make it here more, but yeah, yeah. it's... it's uh, yeah, there's something special about it, I think. You get, like, this diverse – I mean, especially San Francisco kind of pushing people out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is, like, this weird – I mean, Oakland hasn't done that, at least not to a certain point. So you do still have, like, these pockets of working class, of, like, poverty, of wealth. And I think that, like, makes a good city when you have, like, this eclectic group of not only, like, cultures but, like – the different classes of people. It, yeah. I don't know, it makes a cool vibe. Or... Yeah. I think also for Oakland kind of always being in the shadow of San Francisco, mm -hmm. it has actually made it a place where people can do their own thing. Right. Independent of that. Mm -hmm. um, you can just kind of carve out your own little niche here. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. That's cool. Nice. So you've been here for a good chunk of time. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. So wait, when, when was that exactly? 2011. So 2011. I moved out here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so you you saw a good chunk of the chaos of of prices just ridiculously jump. Yeah, things were just starting to get expensive when I moved here. It was right around the time that the art murmur was beginning to really pick up a lot of steam. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. All those articles were coming out. And the attendance was rising. Hmm. And it was like, there was, I think, probably a few times where I was able to like, take advantage of like the old art murmur mm -hmm. quotes. Wait, what's art murmur? I'm not familiar with that. Art murmur is the big first Friday event here. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's been kind of co-opted by the city and the neighborhood association mm -hmm. there. And so it's become more of just a street party. Mm -hmm. um, even to the extent where a lot of galleries in that area are doing other open days because on first Friday, their collectors can't even see the work. There's just right. so many people there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So it was this kind of thing where it was a really cool grassroots event that eventually mm. grew too big and kind of I've never changed. heard of this. Like, I mean, I've heard of First Fridays, like art shows. Mm. Uh, have you heard of it? I'm not I've familiar. never been, but yeah, I've heard of it through other people advertising about yeah. Like, I'm doing something, Art Murmur, come check it out, that sort of thing. Maybe everyone just around me calls it First Friday. Yeah, I'm the, probably. <laughs> that's part of it is that it's become kind of subsumed by mm -hmm. the First Friday thing. Mm -hmm. And even to the point where there are no longer any founding galleries who mm -hmm. started the art member in the neighborhood where it's centralized. Oh, wow. oh right. really? Huh. Yeah. Rock, paper, scissors was the last one to hmm. get priced out of there. Hmm. That's yeah. crazy. Oh, huh, that's interesting. So you kind of got, is that, that's, pr so now it's pretty much just a party? Basically. With mm -hmm. art being the, the reason to get drunk yeah yeah <laughs> like in 2011 and 12 
there was a lot of collectors coming out uh-huh. because they knew that you could see interesting work and get it for an affordable rate. And mm-hmm. it was very much like a direct kind of linkage between artists and collectors. And uh-huh. it was kind of unique in that way. But that was cool. as the, the party grew in size, it just got a little too blown out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there was this brief window of time where you could make rent in a night selling work, there, wow. which hmm. was amazing. That's interesting. Yeah. I wonder how, because you see it all the time with like art, things you know they like you see them picking up pace Mm -hmm. and then there is like a spot where it just becomes too big for the artist like the artist becomes like the the background noise to Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know the machine of i don't know selling booze and making um a thing yeah yeah, it's like you have to like reinvent that moment over and over to get mm-hmm. that sweet spot for the artist or something yeah oakland has also had like a similar kind of thing with street parties mm-hmm. wherein they start as this organic thing and mm-hmm. it's really cool for a while but eventually it just gets too big and the kind right. of the associated problems that come with a bunch of drunk people in a public space for sure mm-hmm. like yeah. like the art murmur was like growing steadily and it was like oh this is cool it's cool for the neighborhood it's cool for local businesses right. and then there was like i think a couple months in a row where there was a bunch of shootings and it was like oh. okay it's gotten too big mm-hmm. like, yeah <laughs> yeah i wonder how that how that i wonder if you need the foresight to kind of see that like there's a certain limit of growth to to kind of be like we're this is our end goal we're not trying to push it past yeah you know this point because that that there's like a point of no return where you can't, you lose everything you yeah. wanted. I mean, that point was where like the business association and the city really started to look at the art murmur as a marketing thing for tourists. Mm-hmm. Um, and when that shift happened, it was like the galleries just kind of became secondary to it. Uh-huh. Yeah. That sucks. So yeah. you're saying like that one government gets involved. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Well, because it used to be like an underground thing, really. Like they, I believe, had permits to close off 23rd and 24th Street in between Telegraph and Broadway. Mm -hmm. And that was the extent of it. But then once the city started seeing that, like New York Times and a bunch of other major publications were Mm -hmm. listing the art murmur as one of those things to do when you're in Oakland, they were like, oh, this is a really good marketing thing for Mm -hmm. us. And so we're going to start dumping more resources behind it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That kind of sucks. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because, you know, city government hasn't done a damn thing for the arts in Oakland otherwise. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of vice versa. It sounds like they yeah. were trying to take advantage of what the arts can do for them. Mm-hmm. Huh. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the same story everywhere. Unfortunately, yeah. it's it's the first thing on the chopping block when money gets tight. And yeah. Everyone loves to talk about how much they love it, but it's not really a priority in terms of funding or resources. Right. Yeah, exactly. Huh. That's cool. I mean, it, it was. It sounds amazing that you can make your your rent in a in a day. It was a really magical. Time. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a a dream. Yeah, I've had multiple times probably. <laughs> woken up and realized that I'm in the real world. So yeah, I mean, it's cool that you live that. <laughs> huh? That's awesome. So, that's it. So, I mean. God, I don't know. That's cool. I'm just trying to figure out how to capture that in a bottle and keep it forever. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that seems to be a huge, like, I don't know. I, I don't, have you ever been in an environment like that? I mean, there's been times where I sell good, you know, where it's like something like either I'm, I don't know. I can never tell if it's like me as the artist tuning into something or, mm-hmm. or just things are priced exactly to sell or something, you know? Uh, but, I've never been in a environment where like, it's like easy, you know, Hmm. it's like, Oh, this is really easy to do. Yeah. I think for that specific period of time, there were quite a lot of people who were really enthusiastic about art and people who were legitimate collectors who knew that they could go connect directly with the artist. Yeah. And ultimately that is what really harmed a lot of the galleries is as, as the party grew, the collectors stopped coming because they're just like, I'm not trying to, elbow yeah. a bunch of kids with tall cans right. just so get i can shot. see the art <laughs> right yeah. exactly yeah 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 and i think the whole like artist collector um like relationship mm-hmm. seems to be very important you know for uh, just because artists are the ones that can really explain their artwork mm-hmm. you know a gallery can only do so much you you as the artist have all the like answers that I'm assuming most people are looking for and they get to kind of get a feel of who you are and 
like how much you put into your work. You know, mm. I, we've talked about it before about how important it is uh, for people to understand how much work goes into what we do. You know? Yeah. I think people making that personal connection with the artist is also important because it is a kind of like romanticized figure. Mm -hmm. And so like when people are able to like talk to the artist and learn more about their personality and their practice, I think right. it, it just makes them feel closer to that kind of, I hate to use the word, the magic, like <laughs> it sounds very cliche, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a role that people still kind of look at as a almost, I don't know, mystical kind yeah. of thing. Well, I mean, I do paint with a magic wand. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes sense. And a wizard cap. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, my wife's going to yell at me for that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, that's true. And I, I don't, it's kind of funny because it's like, it's like the idea of that what we're doing is magical. For me and for most artists, I think we understand to us it's not right. We like get the sleight of hand and mm -hmm. all that, but even like when I think when people see what we think isn't anything, they're amazed. They're yeah. like, That's amazing. Like, you know, like, I don't know, it's kind of is, I guess, but <laughs> I feel like even showing them the sleight of hand is amazing, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, the technical aspect of it is one thing, but I think another part of what people are really drawn to is the idea of being able to kind of visualize something and mm -hmm. then actually make it happen, and make right. it tangible. Um, Cause I think that level of creativity and then the actual realizing of mm -hmm. that creativity is something that a lot of people don't really feel very in touch with. And I think that has a lot to do with how we're taught or not taught about the arts in public school. Right. Um, it's something that just gets tabled pretty sure. early on. Yeah, being so, taught it, let alone doing it in school yeah. is, you know, evaporating yeah. as we speak. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know if in high school or any time in school like normal schooling I was ever taught anything about about art. Mm -hmm. Like about the history of art. Mm. Like or uh, maybe like a little bit in art class. Yeah, I got some in art class, but yeah. not in history class. Yeah, I think we <laughs> yeah. watched like the Jackson Pollock movie. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you learned like, art history or whatever. Like, oh, he was a total bastard. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Where the hate began. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where my deep rage for Pollock began. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, that, uh, yeah. I don't know if anyone, if art history is even, you know, I don't know. I mean, our history in general is pretty garbage in school. So yeah. I guess I get, there's more bigger fish to fry than. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you, I think you really get like stuck in the canon where mm -hmm. it's just like, okay, this is a Renaissance. This right. Is the Baroque. Da, da, da. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like the same, like the same 100 white guys that have mm -hmm. been listed in every mm -hmm. history book. Yeah. And they'll, mm -hmm. they'll slip in Basquiat real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <some> brownie points. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I don't know. It's pretty sad. Yeah. I was really lucky in that some of the courses I took at UNM were, um, were not so centralized with that kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, and also I think learning about contemporary art history, like 20th century stuff is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. like I had a really great teacher who taught me all about the Chicano mural movement in mm -hmm. LA in the seventies, a different teacher who was an expert on Mexican muralism. That's and cool. A lot of other like mural movements that were happening throughout Latin America mm -hmm. during the seventies okay. and eighties. Huh. And so getting all of that kind of context, I think is really, really important because you see like this timeline that starts with Diego Rivera, but then continues up into the present. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, is that your nationality or are you Latin? No, I'm actually um, mostly white. Okay. Because like, my parents are from Pennsylvania. Okay. And they moved out to New Mexico a little bit before I was born. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, I couldn't put my finger on what nationality you were. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm ethnically ambiguous, <laughs> yeah. which was good, like growing up in the Southwest, because yeah. people just kind of assume you're like half or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's cool, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm still barely I, I i don't know if you watch netflix at all but there's this documentary i just watched on it it's like how i get my history i guess but <laughs> yeah. it's called um 
Fuck, I'm drawing a... Do you remember what name it's called? Which one is it? Struggle? Struggle. Have mm-hmm. you seen that? Mm-mm. Oh, it's amazing. Okay. It's about a, a Polish guy who like... Oh, I saw a trailer for it. Uh, yeah. Highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude's work is amazing. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he his philosophies and everything is so interesting when you... Have you seen it yet? Not yet. How dare you? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, How dare you, sir? <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, highly recommend it. I don't want to say anything else now that you guys all haven't watched it. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. But I mean, I will say one thing. One little like fun fact about it is that uh, Hitler commissioned him to do a portrait, and he painted Hitler as a pig and sent it back to him. And it was like, fuck, G move. <laughs> yeah, <that's awesome. laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. That's that's how I get my art history. I mean, every <laughs> once in a while, I'll read an article or mm-hmm. go down a rabbit hole or something. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. Like the, I mean, watching that documentary, I'm like that is so interesting. And you see, like a full life of this artist who's been an artist. Yeah, you know, he was doing the these. Um, he did his last sculpture he did like right before he passed, mm-hmm. and it's fucking amazing. You're like, I don't know how you are that good at like 90 or whatever no, i think he died at like 98 or something it's like oh, wow. it's like how are you that good that yeah. old uh you know but it's it is amazing it makes you think of like how this is like a whole life thing and mm-hmm. he had like these ebbs and flows of art and i don't know should probably look into art history a little more it's probably <laughs> it's probably a tale as old as time yeah well i mean i think that kind of personal story is really illuminating in terms of like learning more about the art itself Mm -hmm. you figure out like what the artist was going through when he was making that particular work yeah yeah yeah. he was very like into narrative i know Mm -hmm. i mean it seems like for your work specifically like you you have this narrative built into your stuff is that and sometimes you know looking at like the work and maybe seeing a title you can kind of see that it seems to have some like historical precedent precedence or something Mm -hmm. built into it of like maybe you're talking about something that I'm not fully aware of. Uh, I remember there was like a chicken piece where like there was burning buildings and it was like built on weak, like, uh, like I forget how it was titled, but something about it's like, called fragile fortress. Fra- there yeah. it is. Yeah. And I was like, huh, I wonder what that's based on. But it was like, it was like all these, like for me, I love when I can read a title and get like a little bit mm-hmm of an extra like insight onto what the artist is saying, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's just the tool that is being utilized. Yeah. And you know, for you, how do you go about building the narrative and maybe even like using the title as, uh, there's always a kind of like underlying narrative or theme that I'm thinking about, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I'd never really want my work to kind of like beat people over the head. Right. With what it's about. For sure. Um, so the title is often just kind of like a suggestion for people. Okay. Um, yeah. Like that piece in particular, I was just thinking about toxic masculinity mm. and the kind of like fragility of this status quo, especially that we I see, see in our government right now. Um, right. So but yeah, do we have a ma- like a, a guy in our government that's in bed? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, pick one. Like, <laughs> all these old dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know why I imagine them as dinosaurs when you say that. <laughs> Actual. Well, dinosaurs. you know, I mean, I don't know if you know anything about the red reptile theory. Oh yeah, that whole conspiracy. The Alex Jones this one. thing is yeah. that the thing where there are lizard people. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that's what Wait, it was so called. Wait, so do you subscribe to that? Idea? <laughs> no, but I think as like a metaphorical device, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like a friend, I was talking to him about it, and he was like, "For me, it's like." I don't know any humans that would do these kind of things. Right. No person in my life. I can consider them capable of the actions of some of our leaders. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, well, they must be aliens. And if they are so <laughs> depraved and fucked up and evil. Like, yeah. And also, I mean, you look at someone like Mitch McConnell and it's clear he's wearing a human suit. <laughs> <laughs> like, it just doesn't fit right. <laughs> uh, yeah. And he has turtle, he has very turtley features. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I think another, but you know, the whole concept of like, is there anyone you know? It's like, I also don't know anyone that really wants to be in charge of a, uh, you know, like a city. Like to me, that's such a weird concept. Is like, who wants to be in charge of taking? Like, who thinks they have the ability to say what 
a hundred thousand people want. Yeah. Let alone an entire fucking nation. Like that's a weird, you know, thing that none of my friends would ever want. It's like a weird, crazy person idea. Of like yeah, that, that level of ambition, right? And ego. I mean, yeah, that's. I think that's a fundamental underlying yeah. thing with it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, you know, but I also hope to never, you know, uh, attract people like that in my life. Anyways, yeah, and it's like the, those people are nuts. You know, the whole fucking thing is crazy. Mm-hmm. But well, I don't know. Hopefully, this trait doesn't. <laughs> Come off tracks. <laughs> uh, I also like want my, mm-hmm. you know, mail to come on time and <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, the little things <laughs> to have food. Yeah, you know, uh, things like that. So hopefully we don't go to shit. <laughs> but whatever. I don't know. At the same time, you got a cool bat, so yep. <laughs> you're ready for like uh, <laughs> your, the zombie apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fuck, we went way off track. I don't even know. <laughs> cool, cool, we cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what were we talking about? Talking about yeah. narrative. Narrative. Oh, yeah. 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 Because yeah. yeah, what? Uh, back to that piece. I was thinking like, like. Not necessarily, like, I I also really like when, like, the narrative is loosely based, and I don't even care if someone gets it or not. It's kind of just for me. But I do find, like, for me, when I saw that, I was like, I wonder if there's any history behind, like, um, you know, sometimes you'll see, like, where someone will talk about, like, a historical moment, but they'll use a lobster based off of some, you know, historical representation of the political leader, Mm -hmm. but it's not so obvious it's just kind of for him unless you dive deep into a conversation with him you won't know that like so i was like oh, i wonder if the chicken is like representing someone or something or that's i don't know that's the rabbit hole i dive deep into but yeah. i mean mm-hmm. that's the great thing about art in a way you know you kind of leave it up to the viewer mm-hmm. to a certain extent to like i made it for this but you can see what you <laughs> want to see or yeah well i think we have like this whole language of archetypes and symbols mm-hmm. that we can choose from for and- sure that is something that has, I think, become more of an influence in my work in the past mm-hmm. few years as I've gotten more interested in tattoo art and mm-hmm. the kind of library of symbols that right. accompanies that. Um, I also think that things like tarot cards are really interesting mm-hmm. um, where you have this kind of like collection of different images that are representative of things. Mm, um, right. Mm. And so, yeah, like with that particular piece, the rooster is a very like – typical kind of symbol of masculinity right that makes sense yeah. mm-hmm. i mean it's called a cock right yeah <laughs> yeah that makes there sense huh i said there you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's always picking fights with other roosters and yeah. <laughs> popping that chest out flaunting those wings yeah <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense it's <laughs> all starting to make sense uh yeah yeah i noticed that with your work too a lot of like re- re- like a uh, repetitive imagery mm-hmm. Uh, which I always love. Like I always love when you kind of, as an artist, for me, it's always fun to like have these, these symbols that mean something. And then based off of kind of how I manipulate everything, then they've changed the meaning in a way, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're just using it as visual language in this weird cluster of a sentence or whatever you want yeah. to call it uh, to kind of explain what you're explaining. And then sometimes, I don't know, I think I'm, a little crazy because I'm doing yeah. it. I'm like, no one's getting this. I'm just in my own. <laughs> well, you know, I think sometimes if it's not necessarily really overtly specific, you'll get a different reading from the audience that mm-hmm. can be mm-hmm. really cool and interesting. For sure. Yeah. yeah that's always great. It's mm-hmm. always funny when it's the opposite of what you're trying to say. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, I'm actually trying to say the opposite. But you kind of can see how you made that connection because mm-hmm. all the words are, are in there. They're just you know, jumbled up into a different sentence or whatever. Yeah. I've gotten a lot of really great insights from conversations like that with Mm -hmm. people. Um, And I think in that way, like the titles can often be just kind of a jumping off point to sort of like think about that and have that conversation. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah, Titles to me are, are one of like the coolest, if utilized well, things Mm -hmm. you can do in a painting. I think it's like, it's such like a trigger point or like a, it's like, 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 you know, it just like sparks the, 
what you can be told about this painting. You can like absorb the painting and then read the title and be like, Oh, now I yeah. see everything. I think they're trying to explain through this piece. And, mm-hmm. and then now I just don't think it's like an awesome piece. It, it like tells me something, mm-hmm. gives me an idea of who the artist is as a person and, you know, the tools they're using to say whatever they want to say. So yeah. It is, it is an amazing thing if utilized correctly. But, you know, sometimes we've talked about it before, how you can also come up with like the lamest over the top artsy, like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I don't know. Well, the one we always do is the wandering eye of a whispering soul. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's like a painting of an apple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're like, all right, I don't know what's going on here. I feel like I'm getting one pulled over on me or something, <laughs> but whatever. There's also the ones that are way too like tongue in cheek, like they're almost like punny titles. Those kind of annoy me for a different reason too, though. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of work that is like that in reference to art history, mm. um, right? Where it just it feels very academic, and it's right. like for an mm. academic environment or like mm-hmm. audience, yeah. and like they're trying to be ironic. Yeah, and it's like well, only so many people are going to get the joke. <laughs> yeah, <you know? laughs> yeah, and it's it's I don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of that in general, mm-hmm. but teach their own, I guess, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not here to heat on artists all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just two hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so, so your work, you said a couple of years ago, it kind of started taking on the, like the imagery of tattooing. Well, I started the series of drawings that I've been collecting in, um, these zines called night songs Mm -hmm. and i'm going to be working on volume three this year okay and the title is just kind of like derived from my like insomnia and tendency to work late okay um Mm. and the idea was to do work that i could finish in a much shorter window of time Mm -hmm. because a lot of like this kind of stuff just takes forever right so you get a little bit bogged down and Mm -hmm. so i wanted to start doing these drawings that i could do in a couple hours right um and also have something a little more accessible for people in Mm -hmm. terms of price point and to just kind of play around with ideas and archetypes and symbols. Yeah, it's um, a good move. And yeah, I have a lot of friends who are tattoo artists. And so I'm like definitely in proximity to that art form. And so I'm always kind of like picking up little things from it. But mm-hmm. in developing that like language of symbols, I started to then utilize those in the paintings and other work. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it kind of creates this like larger ecosystem of what I'm doing. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's a cool, cool little concept. I remember, I remember when I was follow. I think early on when I was following your stuff, I, you were doing like these like little, uh, I think paintings or drawings. I think what you're talking about, mm-hmm. and um, and I was like, oh, those are awesome. And I reached out because I wanted one, and and they were priced pretty well. And I was like, can I get that one? You're like, it's sold. And I was like, Ugh. <laughs> but it was, it was kind of like one of those moments where like I was like, oh, like I really. Like that's a, that is, we've talked about it before about, you know, prints and things like that, where you're trying to, you know, have people that are not going to be able to buy a couple thousand dollar painting or whatever to be able to have something Mm -hmm. because that is important and, uh, you know, and, and it is important to the person, you know, there is something special when, especially if you're a younger person Mm -hmm. and you're able to have an artist that you love and then have a piece that, you know, they worked on and it, it wasn't, maybe it's like a a big amount of money for them, Mm -hmm. you know? And so they're like, but enough to where they can actually own a piece. It is, it is cool. And I remember, I think you were one of the first people that I kind of took note of that, of like, Oh, that's a good idea to like, do these smaller original, like, I don't know if they were paintings or marker drawings. I couldn't, I know they were like usually like two colors, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, they're all ink on paper. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. People yeah. often think they're screen prints. Okay. It's kind of cool. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Cause your work is so like, it's so like solid. Yeah. You know? Everything is put in there so cleanly. And so like, it's almost like you can be confused as, doing it on the computer probably too yeah i mean some people have looked at the work and been like oh that's a vector right mm-hmm. like, nope <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i could totally see that yeah. <laughs> that is a skill that yeah uh you know especially now you know it seems like in art uh it's not as appreciated what uh, draftsmanship yeah no. <laughs> like like the cleanness of it so yeah. like yeah 
uh, you know, it's like you put in work and that's, that takes discipline and it's not easy to do for sure. Mm -hmm. You can see a lot of people who, you know, render things out, try to do solid line stuff and you're like, Oh, well you suck at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Cause it used to be the only way that to do it was by hand. So it was more of a premium that people saw it as a viable skill. Whereas now right, it is, that it's makes like, sense. yeah, now it's a computer thing. Oh, just do it, do my Adobe illustrator thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think with minimalism and conceptualism in the late 20th century, you really had this push against the kind of the technical skill and mm -hmm. the talent of the artist. A lot of people were trying to like completely like step away from that. Right. Which like, I think has some validity, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I think the the flip side of that is like, now you have art schools where people don't learn how to draw or paint. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. It's very, you would never go to a school to become a doctor and they're like, just feel it, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Just feel what's yeah. wrong. Like my dad went to the Philadelphia Academy of Art mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's an old certificate program. Like you don't even get a degree. It's okay. like mm -hmm. the old, old Academy. Yeah. And he, his first year there, all he drew was plaster casts. Mm -hmm. Like okay. you're not okay. even allowed to draw from life your first year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So That's awesome. Yeah, it, it's a kind of different level of like technical rigor, I think. So mm -hmm. your dad's an artist as well? Uh, well, he's been working as an engineer for years. He retired okay. about 10 years ago. But it, it was a really weird kind of like about face. Okay. Mm. Yeah. That's cool. The, have you seen any of his like older mm -hmm. as an artist work? Yeah. Yeah, he did a lot of oil paintings, a lot of landscapes. Mm. Um, it's kind of interesting because the landscapes almost look like New Mexico, but he painted them while he was still living in Pennsylvania. Hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. That's crazy. <laughs> That's cool. Was that a big reason why you kind of kind of dove into the arts? My parents were always really supportive <clears throat> of it. Um, I think they recognized pretty early on that like I had a proclivity for <clears throat> making art and they just like fostered that from the, the get go. <clears throat> also, I mean, it's like, you are not getting art classes in public schools. They are really aware of that and mm -hmm. we're not okay with it. And so they send me to summer art classes all the time. Mm -hmm. Also, like my mom is like, you were not sitting around the house watching TV <laughs> all summer. Get the hell out. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Huh. That's interesting. Uh -huh. it, you know, there there is like this weird thing where um I mean I say it, and I feel like most artists will say it where like they say like you know it's not uh it's not a talent, it's just you working at something, you mm -hmm. know like but mm -hmm. there is something weird where like you know like your dad had like this this kind of artist tendency or you know or whatever and and I had it a bit in my family as mm -hmm. well, and so I always thought when I was growing up before I kind of adapted my thought to say like. You know, like it's just hard work. But I always wonder, you know, the the word like you're talented or you have like some as an artist is kind of I don't know, taboo, but I don't know. There's there's a part of me that says there's probably a bit of your genetics that lends to like being focused on one thing really well and mm -hmm. and noticing the details in certain things that other people just don't notice and yeah. You know, so I don't know. I don't know what you call that. Like, is it? Like, I, I think art, artistic talent can be a hereditary thing. Yeah. I, like, there are definitely other family members who are artistically inclined, and it's on both sides of the family too. Mm. Like, my mom Damn. was a fiber artist and a seamstress, um, mm. and then she taught elementary art for years. Um, nice. So yeah, I was kind of like getting it from both her. sides. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know that's a brutal job. She was teaching <laughs> a thousand students a year. <sighs> Damn. Because they just they don't. They get an art class every two weeks, and so it's just like rotated in and out on this like industrial scale. Gosh, hmm. that's crazy. Yeah, that's like that's like um, factory babysitting mm -hmm. at its highest level. Yeah. She should get a black belt or something. Yeah. <laughs> she needs something. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that's crazy. That's cool though, huh? Yeah, I always because I I am of the mindset that like if you you know five-year-old me wasn't the artist i am today so there definitely took some some work to get to where i am now mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that that those tendencies weren't already built in it just takes a long time to develop them you know it's it's almost like saying a child athlete might show some potential but it's going to take him years of 
playing this sport to get to the LeBron level or whatever. Yeah, you know? mm-hmm. I think that's that's very true. Like you can have the innate talent, but it has to be like fostered and developed yeah. for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Yeah, and there's probably because my, my fostering was probably the very opposite of yours. It was like none, but I was just so into it mm-hmm. that, <laughs> that my mom telling me to be a doctor or something was like that's never gonna, like just seemed preposterous to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, that's never gonna happen. I'm I am not a doctor. Have you seen these clumsy hands? Of mine? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. That's that's really cool. Yeah, I'm really, really lucky to have parents that are so supportive. And also that, like, they just, they get it. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't have to, like, explain, like, art shit to them. They understand inherently, like, the ins and outs of the art world. For sure. Sort of what it's like to be a working artist. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's like one of those things, too, where if, if I had a child, which I don't, but if I did... And they wanted to pursue a passion. It would be like, yeah, like especially when you're young, try your hardest. Like mm-hmm. get your foothold in there and like really make a name for yourself and take your shot. You know, because yeah. you have so much. If you fail and you decide, oh no, I, never mind. You have so much time to be like, I I can go back to school and be whatever. You know, I don't know if your dad went back to school to being an engineer, but did he just not want to do art anymore? You know, I'm not really sure what the the motivation for that was. Um, Because he is, like, a very creative person, but he's also a very, like, technical, detail-oriented kind of person. Mm. And he got a mechanical engineering degree Mm. and Mm -hmm. worked in that field for 25 years afterwards. Um, I mean, it is a grind as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe that was part of it. He saw, like, what that kind of trajectory would be like. Mm -hmm. He maybe had... I don't know what the time frame for all of this was. So like right. maybe I was on the way and he was like, okay, better right, buckle right, down and right, get a real yeah. job. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And I mean Yeah, maybe at the time too, like abstract art or right. conceptual art was was the big thing. So it's like if you're a academic realist doing cast drawings, <laughs> yeah. probably not yeah. gonna sell like yeah. a and illustrations going <laughs> more to digital. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. There was so many like rugs being pulled under artists, mm-hmm. you know, throughout the years. Exactly. Like, you're like, uh-oh. Uh, but I don't know. There is this like amazing thing happening nowadays where it seems like art is starting to flourish. It goes back to, you know, everyone's talking about like the universal basic income. Mm-hmm. And it's this cool like conversation where people are like, well, if that's a thing, then what happens? And then you're like, well, people should pursue what they always wanted to. And then it would be interesting because you would it would be interesting to see how many people wanted to be an artist or whatever mm-hmm. and then um you know then were able to follow that path yeah i think you would see a lot of that i think you'd mm-hmm. see a lot of people becoming inventors too yeah for oh, sure. yeah. like i i think yeah. that is a it's an unfortunate necessity i think with this trend towards automation of all jobs yeah, um for sure but i also think that it kind of could really help people reimagine their life choices and the path they're on, like within a larger kind of capitalist economy. Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. Because so much of that has to do with just kind of deferring your dreams and the things that you want to do exactly. just to like get the paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think things would get better. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so much that like, I don't know, to me, it's like, it, I don't know. It just makes so much sense. Yeah. Uh, and people would be happier. And I think that is such a, like, I don't know, that is so important for just the environment, you know, of like, I don't know, treating people good and, yeah, absolutely. you know, and all these things. It would, I, to me, it would solve so many problems, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think even like looking at that model on a smaller level, just specifically in terms of funding and resources for the arts, mm-hmm. where if we had a system set up where you were getting some kind of support just to do work, mm-hmm. not like so much about the, I think, grant writing paradigm is contingent on showing results. Right. Like you mm-hmm. ask for this money based on the premise that you're going to use it for a very specific thing. And then you have to report back on how you've used it and blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that can be helpful, but also a hindrance for artists sometimes. Right. And I think mm-hmm. like if you had a little more space to just kind of develop ideas as you wanted to develop them, mm-hmm. I think you'd see a lot more interesting, innovating, innovative things happening. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I don't know. 
it, it almost sounds kind of like a union in a weird way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see how that would play out for sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, for me, I always think, especially in art right now, for the most part, I think the cream rises to the top. I think, mm -hmm. you know, the people I think are the best are killing it. And, mm -hmm. and then you just go down the scale and it seems like it matches up pretty well mm -hmm. for the most part. Uh, you know, there's always the exception to rules, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it, there, there would be, I, like for me, art, I feel like it is so limited right now. And there's, it's like, hasn't grown past Instagram and studios and galleries. And I, I think right now, I, I think there are like murals happening, you know, but I don't know. There's something where it's like, if you just gave free range to artists to do so much more, I think it would like, things would just look so much better yeah. in every aspect of art from like, you know, um, architecture and all that to like murals and things like that and mm -hmm. being able to combine all of you know if architects were able to work with artists to to build something where the art was complemented by the building and vice versa it would be mm -hmm. you know some of me i think i don't know yeah i mean i think if like more conceptual artists had greater access to the kind of technology things that are becoming increasingly really like central to i think conceptual art mm -hmm. in like the kind of higher levels like the museum spaces and stuff right. hmm. so much of that stuff costs tremendous amounts of money it requires mm -hmm. a very high level of technical expertise to mm -hmm. do led lighting or projection hmm. mapping or that right. kind of thing um yeah. and so yeah like i think making those resources more widely available to people not just like people with trust funds i think would hmm. be really beneficial yeah for sure that'd be awesome or just make me if they could just make me a trust fund baby, that would be great. I mean, if if all the artists that were, were able to become trust fund babies, that would be pretty good. <laughs> is that enough a thing I can choose? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. What school do you go to for that? <laughs> I, I'm more of like hoping there's a button I can push. Yeah. yeah. Flip that little switch. Yeah. Or an app I can download. <laughs> yeah. The financial security <laughs> app. <laughs> Turn it on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that would be great. I don't know what side effects there are, like, I don't know, sleepiness or <laughs> explosive diarrhea. But, but, yeah, I'm willing to take that on for that app. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's cool. Uh, do you, Should we go to this painting? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so do you have a title for this yet? It's a painting, like, what do you say, like 90-something percent done? Yeah, I'd say 80 to 90%. Okay. Um, the working title for this one right now is uh, State of the Union. State so, of the Union. Again, yeah, very right. like clear kind of political references, even though the imagery in the painting itself isn't necessarily like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. And so the image is of uh, some kind of like bird. It looks like a bird of prey. Yeah. Um, uh, with a snake wrapped around its wing. Uh and it gets burning. It's 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 going down in a blaze of fire with arrows mm -hmm. in its back. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the, sn the snake has bells. Or yeah, the uh, bells are kind of like a, a warning uh -huh. or an alarm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's something that I've been like using a lot in the past mm -hmm. few years. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a super awesome piece. I one of the things I love about. Uh, your work is you seem to have like this idea, like your palette choices always to me are like spot on. I'm always yeah. like, damn, he nailed those. Mm -hmm. Even with like your two color things or like you're, you're pulled back where it's just like a piece of paper with like maybe like three or four colors mm -hmm. or something. It's always like, Oh, like I love those choices he made uh, with the palette. And I mean, this one's no different. There's a lot of like muted blues and, and even the red is like kind of like, muted in a way mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and I, I that alone i love it. it that is like aesthetically pleasing to me it just yeah. pulls my eye and and i go like what the fuck is this uh mm. you know but you know uh to me the, i don't know if the narrative is something where where the the snake is killing itself by killing the bird or i don't know i, I <laughs> I once uh, I remember I watched a documentary with like these artists and this lady she was like doing a collaboration piece with this guy and the guy was she was like yeah the 
he's he was like painting a unicorn cut in half. She's like, I don't even know how to fucking break that down in my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't know. I mean, to me, it's it's definitely got like the the political title. So it's like it seems like it's like going down in a blaze of I don't know if glory is the right word, mm-hmm. but like you know and. I don't know. Does the what does the snake represent in that? Is there anything specifically? Yeah, like status quo, greed, okay. um, the kind of very limited demographic that has been in power in okay. this country since its inception. Um, mm-hmm. So it's kind of like it's kind of like like snakes in general usually mean evil. So mm-hmm. it's pretty much evil. In the, yeah, in, in this particular case, I like I don't necessarily like to kind of apply those Mm -hmm. labels universally i think it's a little unfair to the snakes Um, (laughs) but yeah this image i think is like i found a source image of a hawk being choked out by a snake i was like (laughs) holy shit this is amazing yeah and immediately just thought of the kind of like (laughs) symbolism of that and like the bald eagle is very much the symbol of america Mm -hmm. and like Mm -hmm. for me this piece is a lot about like the kind of ideals that this country was founded upon how much they become infected Mm -hmm. and they were flawed from the outset too because Mm -hmm. that those rights were only available to a limited amount of people and so like Mm -hmm. i think the sort of ongoing project of democracy Mm -hmm. has really like gone off the rails in a pretty serious way and i think the situation we're in now is just the most kind of tangible manifestation of it yeah yeah for sure i mean it's one of those weird things where like like the the, i think the main like the how this country was founded the one of the most amazing things about that were the foresight to say like and we'll leave it open to adapt based off of the times and it seems like right now we're so rooted in like not adapting yeah that the rules that were ad- made for a certain time period are just so like, well, you can't change that. And the whole fucking slippery slope conversation, you know, is yeah. like, so burnt out that I'm like, I don't know, man, I don't know what to do other than, I don't know. Well, for a country that was founded on revolution, we are mm-hmm. so invested in maintaining the status quo. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And that's really disappointing. For um, sure. Yeah. I just want my mail in bread is what I said earlier. <laughs> 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 Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I could see that. So, so to you, is that like? Uh, do you think that we should kind of revolt as much as possible? Is that like? Uh, oh, I mean, that's a that's a hard question. I think a lot of people like to talk about revolution, uh-huh. but they aren't really considering the actual human cost of right. what that mm-hmm. would really mean. Yeah. And like that was one of the things that I think was really beneficial from some of those art history courses that mm-hmm. I got, especially the ones about Latin American muralism. Right. Because we were looking at Central America in the 70s and 80s when mm-hmm. the United States was there fucking shit up. Left right. And, right. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think like it's, I don't know, I just kind of lost my train of thought. Right yeah. there. I mean, as far as the human cost, yeah, you, you see it with like, um, you know, like with uh, Syria and mm-hmm. And uh, what was the um, – was it Egypt or whatever that did that big re- revolution? Like oh, the Arab Spring? Yeah, yeah, the Arab Spring. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean the, in the aftermath of that, you now have a military dictatorship right. and a like rising yeah. Islamic yeah. fundamentalist group. And that's mm-hmm. – I think that's – at least for me personally, I'm always like that is terrifying. Like mm-hmm. that – you know, there's going to be a – when it comes to those things, there's always – seems to be a vacuum. There always seems to be – you know, people that want power, like we said earlier, are crazy people. Mm-hmm. So, like, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's always like the I know I know it sounds fucking horrible, but it is that whole like it's better than the evil you know is better than the evil you don't know mentality is like so easy to cling on to as like a justified reason for not you know pushing harder against things. Yeah, I mean, there are like I don't know, I don't. We, I mean, we're going pretty political. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I heard this um, conversation some guy had on Joe Rogan's podcast where he talked about um, he talked about um, 
you know, like uh, ways to change the government by doing like voter blocks and things like that. Very mm-hmm. like common sense changes that seemed so like um, logical to me as far yeah. as like, and he was talking about doing like a, um, what is it called? Like where each person would get like a certain um, amount of money to, to give to the person they want to support okay. for their funding to like change from like being funded by corporations into yeah. like having people actually have a monetary value of establishing who they want Mm -hmm. to have funding for their campaign in order to have and i was like these ideas seem so common sense for how fucked up our system is to fix these yeah problems that are like huge problems in such a simple way that you know um i was like oh that's that to me sounds like revolution you know yeah and and that's a conversation i'm a little more interested in having because i think some people who are really dogmatic in their beliefs about the revolution thing, mm-hmm. it just doesn't really acknowledge the fact that if that were to actually happen, the people that are already marginalized and oppressed are going to bear the brunt of right. that. Mm. For like, sure. They're going to be the ones getting killed. They're the ones hmm. experiencing famine. Right. You know, outbreaks of cholera because there's no clean water. Right. Stuff like that. That's going to affect poor people the most, right. no matter what the situation is. And yeah, I think sure. in this country, you have so many guns you have so many bloodthirsty greedy people right like the idea of a total collapse of the rule of law is pretty fucking terrifying to me (laughs) Um, seems like a like a pile of hay with just like one match and we all just yeah (laughs) totally (laughs) but yeah i think the kind of stuff that you were talking about i think like being really involved and engaged with local politics first Mm -hmm. and using that to kind of build political affinity mm-hmm. like larger groups that are going to create these kind of voting blocks right. i think that those are the kind of like solutions that i'm interested in hearing about for yeah sure. for sure yeah yeah that that that's the yeah whenever i hear those conversations they make me so like in and in, engage into like oh, okay mm-hmm. there's like there are people mm-hmm. trying to figure out these issues in a way that seems to be more it's less me versus you mm-hmm. more right. like fixed system you yeah know, which is always the problem nowadays we always talk about fuck that side or whatever mm-hmm. but there's no like and this is how we fix it you yeah know? yeah <laughs> uh it's just point the finger and blame whoever's not on your side. well you know i think like tribalism and like fear of the other is something that's really hard boiled into american identity for sure like so much of this country just is just human nature as yeah. well yeah yeah but yeah america's definitely I mean, we got our USA chant, so yeah. <laughs> we love ourselves. Yeah, well, oh. everything about, like, American character is, like, made to USA! be USA! <laughs> USA! There you go. <laughs> but it's made to be in opposition to, like, this this thing, whether it's the savage, it's the, the other, it's right. black people, yeah. it's Mexicans, it's mm. whomever. And also, like, who the other has has shifted historically, depending right. on what the government and the status quo wants to achieve with that. Right. Um, yeah. But it always serves the same end. Mm-hmm. Um, which yeah is the shitty one <laughs> yeah and most people don't win at the end yeah except for the lizard people i believe yeah what they call them. <laughs> <laughs> well i mean if you you look at these like political dynasties and the kind of family relations for and sure. the corporate connections it it is very much like this one little group of people that's always been at the top uh there is a listener of ours who is love <laughs> 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 uh yeah I don't know. <laughs> Shout out to Bigfoot. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of those guys. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's our buddy. <laughs> he dives deep. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, because I'm, me personally, I'm so like hesitant to commit to a, uh, like a conspiracy. Mm-hmm. That's just my nature. I grew up like super religious. So, yeah. So, for me, my tendency is always like pull back and I don't know, man, like maybe, but I don't know. And, uh, so I mean, yeah, I I think that skepticism is really vital. Um, especially in like the era of fake news. Um, but yeah, I mean, you see conspiracy theories so much on the rise because people want a way to make sense of a really difficult, fucked up world. For sure. And I think attaching a much more complex, convoluted kind of backstory to it just makes it easier to, digest how awful things are mm-hmm. like oh it's lizard people or <laughs> yeah, like yeah whatever yeah illuminati or yeah yeah i mean <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know i have no clue it's 
my answer to most things. Yeah. If they, if they like came out with hello facts about hella, by the way, <laughs> shout out to the word hella. Uh, <laughs> we are in Oakland. <laughs> uh, facts about like, like the Illuminati. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> looks legit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, but I don't know. I mean, I, and I don't know who to trust. Yeah. You know? So I don't know. That's my natural pullback. But we were talking about your painting before it went super political. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that wins the award for the most political we've been on this show. <laughs> Probably. Like, uh, well, you subject. know, after the election, I was just like, I've been doing a lot of painting mm-hmm. up until that point about personal stuff, mm-hmm. dealing with emotion and memory and trauma and like, a lot of these things that were kind of removed from the political sphere. Mm-hmm. But then after the election, it's like, well, you can't not do something about it. But right. also, I've never liked really didactic political art, mm-hmm. or at least I've never wanted to make it myself. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So I, I was trying to figure out a way things. that was like the most authentic for me to kind of express these ideas that I was mm-hmm. thinking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good move. I, uh, I think, yeah, if you... For me, when that whole bombshell happened called mm-hmm. Trump, it seemed like it was such a weird wave within art as a whole where yeah. like it like scrambled the artist's brain in a weird way where mm-hmm. we weren't able to like control what made us artists in the first place of like, you know, being able to communicate through this thing. It was like he dictated our art. Mm-hmm. And for me, I was like, I can't let that happen like i can't let this man take away art for me so i was like so like trying my trying really hard to like keep it like you know separate of like i it, it it's almost like i i feel this obligation to talk about it but then i don't want to be dictated by the actions of a wild man you know yeah. <laughs> so well also i really don't think that we should be creating images of a narcissist mm-hmm. like, <laughs> sure. i will never That's paint that point. motherfucker yeah. ever yeah. Yeah, ever sure. ever like yeah and i like no knock to artists who are using his image in their work for sure but i do think like it doesn't necessarily help yeah the bigger picture to continue to put his face out there right even if it's getting like pissed on by a dog or something yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. and i think it like i really think it like hurts like the mental stability of like people you know like us as like a whole it seems like everyone's a little wonkier since you know yeah well i mean listening to his voice i just want to fucking strangle him yeah, yeah. so it's I like know. that's it's what not, I it's mean. not a good thing to have like playing all the time yeah <laughs> there's like this anger attached to him as a person that people that i feel like are normally level-headed people all of a sudden they like are switched into this weird yeah. aggressive mode and yeah. it's weird to watch mm-hmm. and so you know i mean i i do appreciate how you tackle what you're you know what you're trying to say because you for me i was like i can't do it but for you you seem like you did put some effort into you know not uh you know because i mean i have no knocks on people talking about what's going on mm-hmm. in the current environment you know like that's happened forever, you know, as far as artists are concerned and, and rightfully so. And most great paintings by our past have been about, you know, really crucial times in history. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just for me personally, I just couldn't do it, but I do appreciate taking a certain direction where it is, you know, it is present, but you aren't, dictated by it yeah mm-hmm. i think that's really important is to speak on it in a way that feels authentic to you but mm-hmm. to also keep in mind that there are so many ways to approach it right and there are so many ways that this current situation affects people's lives for sure and so there's so many different perspectives you could take on and explore with your work and to an extent i think that art that works in a fairly kind of established satirical vein Mm-hmm. may almost uphold the status quo more than it like hmm. critiques it mm-hmm. yeah um, and i think like really trying to think not to use the phrase but think outside the box um when it comes outside to the bun <laughs> <laughs> yeah when it comes to these kind of things is, is really beneficial for artists yeah um, also to just like not get burned out on things <laughs> yeah. like because i think there is so much political sloganeering and kind mm-hmm. of like yeah rhetoric going on for sure i think art can 
be a part of that, but it can also speak to things on a much deeper level. Yeah. 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 I totally agree. Huh. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that statement about, cause it then, what then ends up happening when it becomes so like, like, uh, inflammatory or whatever it it just polarizes right yeah it just instantly we become oil and water and and they call you know you draw trump with a small dick and all of a sudden they call him you know liberals clap hands and plot it and then the conservatives are like yeah uh, you know snowflakes and yeah uh anti-fascist or fascist or whatever i don't know what, what you know what i mean but it's like not anti-fascist, but like whatever, whatever yeah. you say. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like this like weird, like it doesn't do anything for anything. It doesn't mm-hmm. build dialogue. It doesn't do anything. It just polarizes. And yeah. to me, that's like, I don't know. It's, it's, you're, you're getting rewarded by people that are on your side and you're not helping anything. Really. Yeah. Well, I think one of the most powerful things that art can do is to sort of like, posit this alternative possibility Mm -hmm. to suggest that like things could be different like there could be a different way of approaching things or seeing Mm, things that's interesting yeah yeah i've never thought about it that way huh that's cool Mm -hmm. i like that uh but yeah i have that hmm. i have to think about that a bit Mm -hmm. i should write my i bring a notebook so i can write shit down (laughs) it's not even anywhere near you (laughs) so sergio talk while i pull out my notepad and write this down like play sound effects (laughs) yeah you got some music (laughs) yeah Yeah. exactly yeah sergio uh but uh yeah that's cool i like that sorry you might have to edit this out a bit sergio (laughs) there we go (laughs) Uh, all right. Sorry. <laughs> Have you nothing to talk about, Sergio? Goddamn. <laughs> uh, but so we can pull it back to the painting. Uh, so, I mean, so as far, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we discussed the narrative end of it. So like uh, technically, how how do you go about choosing palettes and how do you go about, I mean, your style is, seems like a very developed style. Mm-hmm. Uh, was that just based off of your love for a certain aesthetic or? Um, you know, it's like a combination of things that I like, there's like my core set of influences and then I've mm-hmm. kind of been adding to that over the years. But a lot of it is coming from, a graffiti background. A lot okay. of it is being really interested in comic books and uh-huh. anime and manga as a kid. Um, I think that's where that hard outline really comes from. Mm, um, right. The color palette, I think, really, really derives from the Southwest. Um, maybe not as much in this one, like uh-huh. because it's a, got a lot of cooler colors. Right. But mm-hmm. like you were talking about, that kind of muted intensity, mm-hmm. and I think that is what like color in the desert is really about. Because uh, yeah, there are sure. a lot of like neutral earth tones, but occasionally like the blue of the sky or a certain mm-hmm. red, it's just mm-hmm. like so intense. There's even something about like like the buildings, you know, like mm-hmm. there's always like this faded patina about them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you want to design your house to look deserty, you always use like faded woods and yeah. things like that. There is that like weird, you know. Like the sun's dried us all out. Kind yeah. Of well, I mean, when you're at like a few thousand feet elevation mm-hmm. and it's sunny 350 days of the year, right. like you're going to get that aged patina pretty quick. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I like that. Uh, yeah. Because for, for uh, some things I decide to do, it's usually because I, there is this obsession I have with like the decay of certain things, you know, mm-hmm. like I, like um, I grew up doing graffiti as well and there was like there's something when your like tag gets rusted through you know and you're like i don't know there's that aging of it where it's like rewarding in a weird way so i love (laughs) these like things yeah like and i don't know using the palette as like defined by the mutedness of the earth or you know or or like the sun affecting things it's kind Mm -hmm. of a cool concept i haven't thought about i mean in a way i have but not too much about 
that specifically, yeah. which is cool. That's a cool uh, way of doing that. How how long did you live in New Mexico for? Um, I was twenty five, almost twenty six, when I moved out here. And you were oh. you born and raised there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So your dad moved from Philly. Mm-hmm. My okay. parents moved out to Las Cruces maybe a year before I was born. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Nice. Yeah. That's cool. Nice. Uh. Uh, and uh, and you already talked about the line work. Sorry, <laughs> I was like, I was like, there was another thing I had to say. Yeah. yeah, did that take a while? Like, do you look back at your old work and kind of go like, oof, or was it? Were you pretty good at? Um, no, I definitely look back at old stuff and kind of wince a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, part of that too is like the content. Sometimes you're just like, oh my god, it's so corny. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Why would yeah. I have done that? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think like I've always been really interested in a very like hard edge and Mm -hmm. clean lines and i think part of that is growing up in the southwest where you have this really established tradition of indigenous artwork Mm -hmm. that is very very graphic oh that's cool yeah and so like that just kind of like has always also been in the back of my mind so it's like this color palette of like neutral earth Mm -hmm. tones it's very graphic sensibility Um, right and Mm -hmm. these are like like old native drawings or something? Well, my parents had a, a lot of pottery from um, indigenous groups and in, primarily in southern New Mexico mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. northern Mexico. Um, and yeah, they're just really, really gorgeous designs. Like the, the Tiwa people mm-hmm. do this really cool like black on black pottery. And black on black? Yeah, it's like they'll burnish the the clay so it's glossy in sections uh-huh. and then matte in other sections. Oh, really? Huh. It's a really, really developed aesthetic. Like you look at it and you're like, wow, that could have been like some modern thing that's uh-huh. in like a fancy boutique in the city. Huh. But nice. it's like a hundred year old pot. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Check that out. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And, huh. Yeah. Can you write that down for me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should have Sergio as my note taker. Because <laughs> yeah. it did not work out well. I'm like, let me write. I was trying to look at my writing. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like writing while talking to you. I'm like, <laughs> that, was, I'm, that is not natural for me to write and talk. Uh, but, but yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. So I, there's also like that cool part about your work where the background, sometimes they'll have like, It'll have like the wood pull through or yeah. like I don't know if you were putting like this like kind of like this like fuzziness or something. I don't know how to explain it to the background so that yeah. the contrast of that to the clean lines just like you know just highlights everything about it. And it does do this tricky thing where you you know it almost seems like you have to commit to what you're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh because flaws will show yeah working in this way there's not really any going back Mm -hmm. per se Mm -hmm. um so i'm generally like planning out the whole composition beforehand um and you know that's uh, something that i've kind of picked up from my friends who are tattoo artists over the years Mm -hmm. is working out the drawing on tracing paper first and then really really refining that outline Mm -hmm. and transferring it onto the wood panel and going from there yeah nice that's cool yeah Mm -hmm. but the, the backgrounds are like a way to create an atmosphere but it's also got like a bit of a technical consideration mm-hmm. in that like that real loose kind of light base coat helps seal the wood mm-hmm. and so this one is all paint but a lot of the work that i have done previously is mixed media so it'll okay. be paint markers pencil or right. wood and i have to do that base coat otherwise the ink will bleed really right. bad uh-huh. um but there's kind of like a, a nice balance because if you put too much on you can't get these really cool gradients with the ink right um, Hmm, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's one of those like learn by messing up a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> There's no book to read mm-hmm. on that. You're just like, let me try this out. Mm-hmm. Uh, that failed. Uh, did you end up having developing this? Did you end up throwing, checking out a bunch of stuff? Like, no. Um, I can't really think of too many pieces over the years where I've just been like, this is not salvageable. I'm just. <laughs> done with it sometimes i'll table things for six months Mm -hmm. or maybe even longer and then go back and maybe like sand out a certain section of it and then kind of rework it Mm -hmm. but i think because i'm doing so much pre-planning a lot of that that initial stage is where like the shit ideas get pushed to the side and you kind of just like distill it into something good oh that's a good move i don't think i ever do much of that i'm like i have like a basic idea and i might do a really quick mm-hmm. doodle 
to like get an idea of where I want things. But it's probably a good move. I know Sergio does a lot of stuff on Photoshop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, which seems like an okay move, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I've I've definitely used Photoshop to compose things before, so yeah. It's like you know, use whatever tools you got. Like. I was just trying to show, throw some shades. <laughs> <his way. laughs> yeah. I saw that look he gave. Me. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I used to be like a purist about things and be like, "Oh, I'm not going to use a ruler. I can mm-hmm. like draw this straight line, like, yeah. super straight." And now I'm like, "That's fucking stupid. <laughs> yeah. Like, work smarter, not harder." Yeah, there was, sure. there was a weird conversation I got onto on Instagram because there was this guy who was doing this landscape painting. He was doing a bunch of trees, and to mask off the branches, he was using tape. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Oh, that's pretty cool. I've never seen anybody use it." for that sort of thing and some guy on there was like uh um it's like it would have been better if he didn't use tape it's like why it's like such an easy way to <laughs> do that and it's like i don't know i just got into this whole conversation about being a pure artist and like you're not a mm. true artist if you're not doing like pencil to paper sort of thing that it's shit ridiculous is so stupid <laughs> because you look at the fucking old masters and they were using projectors for sure. like yeah. they're all using camera obscura like mm-hmm. that whole tim's vermeer did you see that yeah, uh-huh. yeah the whole yeah, it was camera obscura thing yeah yeah. yeah, so it's like, well, I mean, they had tools at their disposal. For sure. They used them, so no yeah, reason why we shouldn't do Rightfully so, same. yeah. Yeah, I agree. But um, I was just trying to talk to that <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny you mentioned, like, your mode of working, because I've tried to do that and would like to be able to just be kind of off cuff. But uh-huh. every time that I do, I just make a huge mess of things. And I like, do that okay, sometimes. <laughs> time to get the sander. <laughs> Here's yeah. a painting I'm working on right now where... Uh, I painted it. I showed it. I know I wasn't happy with it, but it had to fill the space. It was like mm-hmm. my biggest piece of the show. And I was like, fuck. Mm-hmm. And then I went back to it recently and I reworked it. And I'm like, I still hate it. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm thinking I have to cut out a whole section of it and then I'll fix it. But I'm kind of, I've got to build up the courage for that. Yeah. But mm-hmm. at the same time, it's, like literally cut it with my table saw, like cut it in half. Yeah. Um, mm. But um. But yeah, it, I don't know. It it it's to uh, that that's what I get for doing what I do. Yeah. Really. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, I actually drew that one out, so uh, <laughs> that just shows you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's real fickle. It's just like sometimes the painting does what it wants to do. And yeah. You're just kind of like along for the ride. Yeah. It's like it, as a pencil drawing, it looked good Mm -hmm. and then as a painting i was like nope not so good yeah i mean this has been an interesting process for this because it started as a pencil drawing about that big okay and then i scanned that and then projected it okay and Mm. traced that image oh that's cool i've never i've never heard that process i got a projector last year to use for indoor murals Uh um, okay and it is so nice really (laughs) so so nice yeah not having to do a grid or like that kind of thing okay yeah Huh. Yeah, MJ was just asking about that, right? Yeah, my wife, she's been uh, really trying to pursue muraling. Mm-hmm. And so she's locking down murals right now. And she's she's like trying to debate if she should buy a projector or – and I was like, we'll just grit it out. Like it, it'll be fine. Uh, and it'll kind of like force you to not have to rely on a projector in case you were like in an enclosed environment. Yeah. But I didn't know indoor projector things because, I mean, that's pretty small. Yeah. Like if you base that, I mean, it's huge that paint you're painting, but Mm -hmm. if you base it on like a mural size, it's, that's tiny. So, so yeah, I mean, that's interesting. The one I have is a short throw projector. So it'll do like a hundred inch wide image from five feet away. Oh, Oh, all right. So it's really made perfectly for indoor settings. Like I could could be in a hallway and could be like projecting. I'm going to have to get the details on that later. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Huh. Wide throat lens. I'll remember that. Maybe. Yeah, like the whole idea with that was just to kind of have more pro- professional tools at my disposal. For sure. Because mm-hmm. the mural thing is very much like a major portion of my income. And mm-hmm. oh. mm-hmm. it's predominantly commercial art. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I'm not really doing anything like this. Like right. people don't want flames and blood <laughs> and skulls and all that kind of dark shit <laughs> going on. So it's a little bit different of an approach, but it's also just like, Anything I can do to streamline that process right. is going to mean I'm getting paid better. Right. So, yeah. More and also reducing the, the wear and tear on my body because right. you know, I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> Mirroring is kind of tough. Uh, I don't know. You look like you're getting younger. <laughs> <laughs> Just from the short time I've seen you, I yeah. feel like your hair is getting darker. <laughs> so, 
that beard's uh, getting less gray. Yeah, <laughs> shit. <laughs> Every time I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh, God, more salt and pepper. Here we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. The, I think there's this documentary called Benjamin Button. You might want to look into it. <laughs> it's got all the answers you're looking for. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah that's cool. Huh. That's interesting. Because, yeah, I mean, we, we've been kind of discussing mural wing. I don't know how much on the podcast, but just in general, because Mm -hmm. it does seem like a really good outlet for artists to kind of get some monetary value in a, like a legitimate way, Yeah, you know? Um, So that's, that's interesting to hear that you're getting, I I mean, there is that give and take of like, you aren't in control of what you're creating, Mm -hmm. you know, to a point. So that's always the tough part, especially as an artist Yeah, to forfeit that. And even in a, I mean, for me, it's like pulling teeth. I'm like, Ugh. yeah. Well, and trying to find a good kind of aesthetic middle ground mm-hmm. with clients that are like in the tech industry, for example, right. um, where you're trying to do something that feels authentic to you, but is something that they're going to be comfortable cutting you a check for and mm-hmm. also having in their office for however many years that right. it's going to run in there. Um, yeah, I think it's challenging. Sometimes it can be kind of frustrating, but mm-hmm. I also think it is good as an artist to not necessarily always do exactly what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Like, I think a lot of these commercial projects have been good kind of like assignments for me to mm-hmm. right. try new things or get outside of my comfort zone a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's cool. Do you end up like, is that something that you, like, do you, I'm assuming you don't promote those things usually on your social media. I'm not 100% sure, yeah. I know, but I'm assuming... How how do you go about that? Is that like a whole different like version of your art world where the corporate world kind of sees this portfolio of your work, but the who you are as an artist kind of stays separated in a way? No, I don't. There's not really any distinction like in terms of social media. Like I'll post oh. all that stuff on the same oh, account. Okay. Yeah, I know I've seen some murals, but I wasn't yeah. sure what they were for mm-hmm. exactly. But okay, that makes. And I see that. Yeah. Most of the murals I do are commercial work at this point. Okay. When I first moved out here, um, I was doing a lot of free stuff just kind of out in the community because, A, the like, mural boom was really picking up in Oakland at the mm-hmm. time. And mm-hmm. so people were, like, hip to that. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I had just moved out here. And so it was a really, really good way to kind of advertise myself and, mm-hmm. like, put my name out there. For right. sure. Yeah. Yeah, because the murals, at least, that I've seen on your – on your the reason I asked was because the murals I see on your Instagram seem very similar to your work. Yeah. I mean, there is obviously like I just assumed it was like this mural version of your work almost, yeah. you know. But I mean, so you do end up holding this part of you your art does still kind of stand in that realm and mm-hmm. uh, and kind of hold its authenticity to it. Yeah. You know? I think like having that adaptability is good. Um and also, in a lot of ways, it's just kind of like taking technical aspects of things and applying them to slightly different subject matter. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Huh. My wife is loving this shit right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm like thinking of questions she wants me to ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have any. I'm too smart. I guess it's what I'm for. <laughs> uh, nice. That's cool. Uh, and have you... So you've been doing murals for a good chunk of time now, then. Well, you know, it wasn't really a thing until I moved out here. Because, uh-huh. um, like, I wrote graffiti for years, mm-hmm. and I'd done a little bit of painting in galleries as part of installations I was doing. Right. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't really doing public art in the way that it is out here. Like, mm-hmm. I think Albuquerque is now starting to jump on that bandwagon a little bit, but mm-hmm. it wasn't really much of a thing mm-hmm. back then. Um, but as soon as I moved out here, people were like, Oh, paint a mural. Mm-hmm. And like Ernest Doty, um, also from Albuquerque, he mm-hmm. moved out here maybe six months before I did. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. he kind of got a jump on things and had a bunch of projects going. And so right when I first moved out here, I was doing a lot of collaborative work. Mm. Like I did a big wall with him and Thomas Christopher Hag, um, did a piece over in West Oakland with Santos Shelton and Josh Mays. Um, mm-hmm. So in a lot of ways, it was a really good way to meet people and network and kind of like, be like, hey, I'm here. Right. Check me out. For sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I feel like I'm very late to this. My wife is super eager to do it, and she's mm-hmm. kind of forcing me to be a part of it. Yeah, <laughs> which I'm not mad at at all. It's actually been extremely fun. Yeah, uh, to do. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely 
seems like a thing that in that way, it like does open you to this weird section of like artist, I guess, and mm-hmm. of, of an environment that I'm not used to as well. I'm, I'm used to being in my little nook yeah. and protected by my four walls <laughs> and my big giant dog. So yeah. Yeah. When you're out there, like just on the street yeah. painting, dealing with people, yeah. getting really weird feedback sometimes, <laughs> but sure, also yeah. it's like really great too. Like, mm-hmm. I think, you know, the gallery is a very intimidating space for most people. Mm-hmm. And again, going back to those kind of shortcomings of our education system, people don't know how to talk about art. Right. And so they don't feel comfortable speaking on art in a gallery setting. Mm-hmm. Whereas like out on the street, if you're painting a mural, any random person is going to be like, oh, that's about blah, blah, blah. Or I see this or that. And like people feel a lot more comfortable about talking about art in right. that setting. And I think yeah. it's a really, really important thing in that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. The other thing, too, is like, uh, you know, when I was younger, I would do graffiti. And there is like this weird thing where I miss that action. Mm -hmm. And I want, I get these like huge urges. But like dealing with the court system is is a horrific, unfun thing to do that, Mm -hmm. you know, very much works for stopping me and, you know, whatever, some of my friends from doing it anymore. So it is... um, uh, so it does kind of, for me at least, fulfill like this weird like urge to paint on walls, yeah, like a caveman or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have a similar urge, but I definitely noticed at a certain point it just became less appealing to paint illegally for me. A because mm-hmm. of the risk factors, B because of the hassle, mm-hmm. but also like I started to just get this like lingering guilt about like painting on people's shit. <laughs> when you're younger, you're just like, fuck it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Tag. And yeah, as I've gotten older, I'm just kind of like, it becomes harder and harder for me to not right. think about the person whose wall that is. And right. you know, whatever. Yeah. Sorry. Schmo has to be out there buffing it the next day. <laughs> right. Exactly. I'm like, Oh yeah. When you're at least for, in general, it's like your actions, usually you can just justify them with whatever logic you want, you mm-hmm. know? So when you're young or whatever, you, you just justify it as like, you know, screw the man or whatever. Yeah, mm-hmm. Like exactly. there's all these like things you're like justifying whatever you're doing. But yeah, the older you get, the more like kind of like aff- things that affect you from the outside world mm-hmm. as well, I think also makes you empathize with that, you know, like yeah. people's actions causing hardship or making your life more difficult you start thinking like uh, you know like i'm being an asshole to others you know uh, yeah like it really bums me out to see how totally crushed chinatown is mm. because it's a marginalized community right it's immigrants mm-hmm. it's a lot of people who don't necessarily have a cultural frame of reference for graffiti or right. why people are painting on their shit mm. and like yeah, it's just kind of a bummer to see how just like uh-huh, smashed it gets all the time. I never even thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the the Dragon School project, I think, is in some ways a response to that. I'm not familiar. Um, that's like an ongoing mural project that's happening in downtown, mm-hmm. like specifically in Chinatown in Oakland. Okay. And um, I'm blanking on the artist's name who started it, but he he's an L.A.-based artist, but he comes up here pretty regularly, mm-hmm. works with youth in the community and also with local muralists and the idea oh. is that they're painting 99 dragons throughout Chinatown. Hmm. Um, oh. And it is a really good, I think, kind of antithesis to just like all of the, the throwies that are everywhere. Otherwise. Is he like an old, old graffiti guy? Um, not old. I'd say he's probably around our age. Okay. Yeah. Because um, there was, I, I used to live in East Palo Alto for a bit and we used to have a guy who was like an old graffiti head who mm-hmm. would like do like a program with the kids yeah it sounded very familiar or yeah. very similar i was wondering if the same guy but guess not yeah <laughs> well you know i think like it's it's interesting to look at these subcultures as i get older and to see the way that they change and also the way that my own mindset about things changes mm-hmm. um i don't think graffiti culture is the way that it was when i started mm-hmm. i mean obviously but like a lot of things have really changed and like For sure I think part of that, those changes, is also what made me feel a little less engaged with it over mm-hmm. the years. Um, yeah, there's more. Of, it's more of like that that like revolution concept of like they're so anti everything. It's so so uh, you know. Uh, it's like like it's like a big thing to paint over murals now with mm-hmm. throws, and it's yeah. like this whole idea of like 
you know, screw the artist and, and it'll run longer. So that's why I do it. And mm-hmm. all these like reasons that don't seem worth it to have an enemy of someone who's also trying to like, mm-hmm. you know, who seems like they should be on the same team of you as you or whatever, or tribe or whatever you want to call it. But it's, it's this weird, it's this weird, like, are you against everyone now is, you know, like, I don't know. I don't understand it, but yeah, it is what it is. And there are these guys who are like the older bombers of the mm-hmm. day who seem to be kind of dictating that path, you know, Yeah. and, and making it where like, Oh, this is the cool thing to do now. And you're like, aren't you guys too old to be like kind of making kids do these stupid things and thinking they're cool. But yeah, it is what it is. I think there's also a phenomenon, especially here where mm-hmm. Oakland is considered to be a destination for writers. Oh, for sure. Like mm. the word is that like, oh, you can paint and do whatever you want here. There's very minimal police issues. Mm-hmm. Like there's plenty of space to paint on. And it and the kind of nature of Oakland has made it a place for underground cultures to really thrive in, right. in that way. And so like when I first moved out here, I think I began to really notice this sort of like, uh, how do I phrase this? It's almost like graffiti gentrification where you mm-hmm. had lots of people coming here from outside of <laughs> Oakland. They'd come through, burn themselves out in six to eight months, just bombing the shit out of everything. And then would just go either to new Orleans or to New York or right. to Detroit. Right. It's kind of like you rotate from one yeah, those are the economically four. depressed American city to the yeah. next. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's exactly the rounds they make. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I totally see that. And yeah, and Oakland was, I don't know, especially like when they were, the freeways were just getting mm-hmm. demolished. I mean, they still kind of are, but for a bit there, they were doing so much construction on the freeways yeah. mm-hmm. that there was just like this perfect environment to, as a calling card yeah. to anyone driving through Oakland to be like, Mm. Well, this is such a crazy landscape because you it is like a West Coast city, but in so many ways, I think it has a lot in common with the Rust Belt, with cities like Detroit, okay. right? Where mm-hmm. you have this massive industrial infrastructure mm-hmm. that's now all falling the fuck apart. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and the kind of associated economic and social depression that comes with that. For mm-hmm. sure. Um, yeah. yeah. That totally makes sense. Yeah. So. But it is a really ripe environment for creating art in an illegal fashion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I always have this weird debate with myself about the importance of graffiti because you see so much good artwork that comes out of people that started off doing graffiti, Mm -hmm. you know. And but there is this huge darkness to that environment as well. Well, I think it's it's a culture that's really rooted in a kind of antagonistic, antisocial mindset, right? And I think that has a lot of value as a perspective, but I think it can also be really toxic if Mm -hmm. you are just so entrenched in it and that's all you're really thinking about. Yeah. And there is like the whole, like, you know, I mean, I've had plenty of friends who go down a dark path and, Mm -hmm. you know, there is like a weird criminal uh, element to it that also gets attached to other things that are criminally, you know, like, uh, whatever it is. And, and those paths can lead to just like, you know, just prison time, legit prison time, yeah. and things like that. And you just see people like who started off as just, you know, eager graffiti kids yeah. and then go down darker and darker and darker paths. And, yeah. you know, things get more and more serious. And, you know, you're like, I don't know, like, but there is this, there's like these two different, pro, there's these pros and cons that come out of it that you're like, mm-hmm. I don't know, like the art world some of the great artists of our time right now have have come from that yeah that world i think if you look at the kind of inspiration and upbringing for a lot of contemporary artists especially Mm -hmm. people who are working in a sort of painting or drawing mode Mm -hmm. especially people who are doing murals Mm -hmm. most of those folks are going to have some kind of common thread tying Mm -hmm. them back to graffiti or skateboard culture right um Mm -hmm. yeah and i think those youth subcultures are really a really important like means of social change mm-hmm. um uh, i think there's also this like there is this uh part of you that when you're doing that you're able to risk so much for so little mm-hmm. you know and 
that mentality is so helpful when being an artist. I oh, yeah. think, you know, just being able to just like almost not care if you fail because it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's not being precious about your work. Yeah. It's like the, the act of creating it is almost the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And so like the record that it leaves behind is really secondary. To right. That. Yeah. Um, even though graffiti is fundamentally about fame and being seen, right. I think it is still extremely ephemeral. And mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. that can be a really good lesson as an artist. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And hopefully, it, I mean, there is always the guys who have beef with everyone for everything. You know, so. Well, you know, like, it's, it's tempting to be like, oh, that's a new thing. All these young kids are just fucking up the culture. Right. But like, if you go back and you watch Style Wars. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. They interview mm -hmm. Cap, and it's like, no, this mentality has existed since the oh, culture yeah. it, like came up. So, For sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that has been, <laughs> yeah, that that, yeah, it's yeah, it seems like they're one in one, in one but yeah, it just is a part of the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, shit, like <laughs> the term "capped" is from his name. Yeah, so yeah, it's like, yeah, it, it yeah, the, so I don't know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and even I don't know, and uh, I don't know. It's tough. It's a really yeah complicated. We could have like six podcasts about, <laughs> yeah. <it. It's> like, <laughs> about graffiti culture yeah. and yeah. the world. Yeah, yeah. And I always just feel like an old fart too. Just too. like oh, it's changed so much. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's like anything. I think you see a lot of people creating art that is really shitty, but mm -hmm. it's easy to focus on that and not think about all the work that the really good work that's happening. Yeah, well put. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally true. And sometimes the people that are making the shittiest art get the most attention. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of have to like pretend or not give a shit about that. Yeah, that's, right. that's yeah. what it's about. It's just not give a shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, focus on the people that are killing it. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it is what it is. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Graffiti is a, it's like a, it's like this beautiful thing I hate and love. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's, for me, it's attached to the experience. You mm -hmm. know, there is something magical about, at least for me, when I was in that time. Yeah. Of like the recklessness and the chaos and the, everything that goes with it that I now would never be able to do just because mm -hmm. of how, who I am now, but at the, that perfect timing of when I was able to do that, yeah, it's like this beautiful thing where life is chaotic in this great way. And, you know, I don't know, you just live a certain, I don't know. It's, it's just, but it's, when you, I look back at it, there's also a part of me that's like, fuck, I probably, you know, I was just so young and dumb and yeah. like, it was great, but who paid the consequence for my shittiness? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. It's, you know, something it has really taught me, I think that is super important and that I carry with me still is, um, understanding the city on a like more underground level, mm -hmm. like understanding the kind of ins and outs and the history and growth of a city mm -hmm. on the, the level that you don't see on the surface. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that can be really fascinating. For sure. And out here in the Bay Area where there is so much history still, um, I think it's a really interesting thing. Yeah. Like, you know, the whole like the urbex thing, I think, overlays with writing graffiti very much. And like Urbex? Oh, that's a horrible term, but urban exploration. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, again, going back to that industrial infrastructure here, like there's mm -hmm. so much shit you can go like check out. For and sure. Walk around and like... I think those experiences for me have always been really inspiring for my own art because yeah. like you look at the passage of time, you can think about these spaces and how people use them in the past mm -hmm. and what they are now. Like, yeah. like the idea of like liminal spaces is really interesting to me. Like, you know, the abandoned yeah. building, the alleyway, the yeah. whatever. It was Just, always interesting for me when you would see on Flickr, like an ur a person getting into urban exploring <laughs> yeah. and then through that they would almost always get into graffiti as well yeah. they would like start like seeing graffiti and like oh that's cool and take pictures of it and yeah and graffiti are people that did graffiti would like respond to their pictures because they were like cool you went there and took a picture yeah. of my stuff and then there was like this weird relationship built hmm. 
and then an appreciation and then they would get familiar with who was mm. getting up a lot it was always this cool like thing to see happen yeah uh but i don't know that had nothing to do with what we're talking about just, <laughs> that just made me think about that i haven't thought about urban explorers for a while mm -hmm. <laughs> it is a fun thing to go into like abandoned buildings and have this free range of like this huge structure and just yeah. kind of hang out there with friends and break things and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and drink beers or yeah. do whatever you know and uh write on stuff uh yeah yeah that, Huh. Urban Explorer. Have you done that since? Or? I mean, yeah, here and there. Primarily just to go to places to paint. For but sure. Yeah. It's yeah. like, there's just so much here. I mean, you can just like go out to the Albany Bulb mm -hmm. and like the whole thing is built on landfill. Mm -hmm. Like you're walking along the edge of the water and there's like a staircase mm -hmm. just like there and with all this debris. And so mm -hmm. I think it like plugs you into history in a really, really interesting way. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. I know you've been doing like these, these new like sc almost sculptural things mm -hmm. recently, uh, where you're, uh, you know, you're making like, well, there's in your work there's these like, there's these like, you know, abstract kind of like smoky shapes or yeah. things like that, and they seem to be, you know, like very similar to that in your sc sculptural stuff, mm -hmm. and and I, I know we talked about it a little bit before we started the podcast. But it seems like that's kind of a direction you're going. Yeah, is that like something you're uh, that, or how did that start? Or what is there? Um, you know, I used to paint on found wood a lot, especially uh -huh. when I lived in New Mexico. Um, <laughs> when I moved out here, it became a little harder to find. I think just because it's a lot moister here, so right. finding like panels of aged wood is mm -hmm. not the easiest thing to do. Right. Hmm. But like starting to look at the driftwood, I was like, okay, this is maybe a different way of looking at that. And like those cloud shapes that you were describing, mm -hmm. those like contrasted with these kind of hard edge geometric forms mm -hmm. is like that kind of imagery is something I've been playing with for a really long time. And for me, it's sort of like a representation of like um, – structure versus like the organic right um or you know you could take any number of binaries with that mm -hmm. um but yeah this idea of sort of like organic free-flowing energy or feelings or thoughts contrasted with like a really kind of hard-edged rigid right. structure yeah um, and so the the driftwood sculptures are kind of like exploring that mm -hmm. so taking these organic forms and then like intersecting them with geometric shapes in some way or another they look at, like you're like they look like you're having fun with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you can kind of see as an artist, it's always fun to explore an idea. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it's almost let you kind of loosen up and play yeah. around, which is always a fun stage of creating, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think playing with materials that are kind of outside of your comfort zone is mm -hmm. really good. Um, and just sort of expanding your palette that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I totally get that. There was a one other thing uh, that I... I just wanted to bring up really quick, but uh, there was a movie I watched that you were in. Yeah. That was pretty cool. It was, uh, what's it called again? It was like, uh, Sorry to Disturb. Sorry to Bother Sorry You. Sorry to Bother yeah. You. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that was just a cool thing I saw. I was in the movie theater and I was like, oh, holy shit. Yeah. And like, good for him. Like, <laughs> really cool uh, presence in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? Um, a friend of mine has an apartment downtown, mm -hmm. and he hosts art shows there from okay. time to time. So I had a show up, and he was like, "Hey, uh, they're filming Boots' new movie, Boots uh -huh. Riley. Uh -huh. They're filming his. They're doing some scenes in my apartment, so mm -hmm. they need you to like sign a release." And I was like, oh, "Okay, whatever," <laughs> because I had had a mural in this movie called Frank, uh -huh. um, which is a really funny and weird dark indie comedy okay. about Frank. like it's about like out. indie music and like the music blog scene and like pitchfork and south by oh, okay. southwest sure. and okay. all that kind of shit uh -huh. the main character frank is like the singer of this band and he michael fassbender plays him and he okay. wears oh, yeah. a paper mache head <laughs> huh. the whole movie huh. it's really fucking weird yeah. um but yeah i had a mural in a bar in albuquerque that uh -huh. was like a stand-in for an austin venue okay and so uh -huh. i signed the release for it and i asked them for some money and they're like eh. but then i saw the movie and it's like all the way in the back of the shot completely right. out of focus and it's like 15 seconds so mm. i thought that was going to be the case for sorry to bother you uh -huh. but 
it ended up being like a really pivotal part of the movie. Which yeah. It's just like, oh shit. This is <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I saw that. I was like, good shit. <laughs> so many friends are in that movie. Like it was, mm. it was just a really cool project to be involved with. Yeah. yeah. That, that was a crazy movie. I had no kind of, con- I had the trailer concept of what was going to yeah. happen in the movie. And <laughs> It took a hard right. Oh, it's it's so funny when people are like, "Oh, I finally watched the movie. What the fuck is up with the horses?" Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I loved it. I was yeah. like, "That is, this is like a version of, um, I don't know, almost like a Sixth Sense or something, but in yeah. such a funny mm-hmm. and weird way." I feel like that movie really kind of encapsulates what the past eight years in Oakland have been like for me, <laughs> like. <laughs> Like it touches on Occupy, it touches on gentrification, uh-huh. it touches on just the way that the the art scene has been transformed in the uh-huh. past eight years. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like certain things about it. The way that tech industry people speak in that movie, I think, is so on point. So on point. <laughs> and like the horse thing, like, is a really good rhetorical device for kind of understanding that level of like hubris, where mm-hmm. they're just like, yeah. "No, it's about productivity." Exactly. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. the logic makes sense. Right. Right. Without all the logic. So yeah. <laughs> but how you got there is so <laughs> yeah. great. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It is dark and hilarious yeah. and weird and everything good about you know uh indie type film like yeah, that yeah, definitely. you're like oh cool you had no boundaries yeah and you took it all the places you wanted to yeah well narratively it reminds me of like a mixtape almost because mm-hmm. <laughs> when i first saw it i was like oh the plot is kind of weird and disjointed mm-hmm. a little bit but the second time i watched it i was like oh no this is like an album it's right. like these three to five minute vignettes that are related to each other but they don't necessarily seamlessly go from one into mm-hmm. the next mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah. yeah, good movie, man, and mm-hmm. and cool seeing your stuff in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. That oh, sorry, I almost dropped my notebook. That's super important to have on me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, that was cool. I was interested. So we have two questions that Sergio asked at the end. So he'll <laughs> talk for for once in his life. <laughs> Pass the baton. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we usually uh, end the podcast by uh, asking our guests who, well, it started off with our, we wanted to know who your top five dead or alive artists are. Oof. And it's kind of, um, yeah, that's kind of the, the kind usual of, response to that. Yeah. The question has changed a bit. Yeah. And now it's like a top five living artists. It, it's kind of a way for, for artists to, like kind of give a shout out to people that they're into right now. Yeah. Yeah. And most people would say the same dead artist over and over again a lot yeah. of times. So we kind of like it this way. Yeah. Mm. Um, living artists. I don't know if I could do just five, but mm. there's, there's people whose work I look at and I'm like, damn, I wish I could paint like that. Mm-hmm. You know, someone like James Jean. Mm-hmm. Um, For sure. His work has always been a huge influence on me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's artists who are doing things that are a little more conceptually or material based where I'm also just like, damn, I wish mm. I was doing that. Mm. Um, Tamara Santabanez is one. She's a New York based artist and tattooer. Okay. Um, okay. And she's been doing some really, really incredible work over the past few years. Um, mm. awesome. She was doing these huge paintings of leather that look like hmm. landscapes, just like close-ups of folded textured leather. Uh-huh. Um, really? Huh. But more recently, she's been doing work that really kind of like conflates elements of like bondage and fetish culture and Mm -hmm. Mexican traditional folk art. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah, it's really, really (laughs) interesting stuff. Um, That's such a crazy uh, mixture of ideas that I can't even really picture it, but at the same time, I kind of (laughs) can. She made like a set of manacles out of clay, but it's done in that real traditional like Spanish tile style with like the floral decorations and stuff. It's like white. Uh, blue and red huh. yeah huh. definitely someone gotta look up yeah, yeah super <laughs> cool stuff um there's a colorado-based artist named uh, marcia robinson i think is her last name her instagram is strange dirt um <laughs> and she does these really really cool botanical illustrations that hmm. are super super detailed and really just kind of like i don't know very like lyrical and there's a lot of movement to them but mm-hmm. they're just, just flowers like yeah. But really cool looking alien flowers. It's very cool oh. stuff. Um, what about it? Do you like about it, the way they're painted? Yeah, I mean they're they're very graphic. Mm. Um, 
but they're also super detailed. Hmm. Um, but it doesn't feel like scientific detailed. Like they're very stylized at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then she does these kind of geometric forms that like frame them in a way. And like hmm. those forms are very reminiscent of some of the Native American traditional folk art stuff that I was talking about. But at the same time, it it's not appropriative of it. Like it's reminiscent right. of it without actually taking it from it. And like, huh. I think, you know, there are these larger conversations about cultural appropriation that are really important to have. Mm -hmm. And so seeing artists who are able to synthesize influences without like, taking from those influences um, in a kind of detractory way is really inspiring and cool to see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's three, right? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Pressure is on. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's uh, the guy who tattooed my hand, actually. Um, his name is Zach Scheinbaum. Uh -huh. He mm -hmm. is from New Mexico originally, but splits his time between New York and San Francisco now. And okay. he's an amazing tattoo artist, but his fine artwork is really, really interesting. And mm -hmm. he's someone who's taking a lot of these kind of symbols and the like visual language of tattooing mm -hmm. and applying it in a fine art way that I think mm. is really, really interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Mm. Sounds cool. Yeah. Nice. And uh, I'll do one dead artist for the fifth one. <laughs> for sure. Because <laughs> like, like, I really, really love Georgia O'Keeffe's work and okay. always okay. have. <laughs> and I think like her, her perspective on the Southwest is a really good one. For um, sure. And it's also very kind of indicative of like what people from the East Coast who move out there, like how much of a mind expanding experience it is. Mm -hmm. And like being that was like my parents' experience with the Southwest. Oh, like, got it. Uh -huh. I can see those kind of parallels. That's like cool. I can always spot an East Coaster in New Mexico. Right. The one person who's like always in a hurry and really stressed out. <laughs> oh, everyone yeah. else is like, oh, you just slow down, bro. <laughs> Like you uh, just got here, didn't you? That's yeah. a real thing, right? Yeah. Like there's like studies been done about the size of your city and the pace you walk. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. And yeah. The, the way you, how fast you talk or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah it's <laughs> super weird and interesting. Uh, but yeah, it would be fun to see if you could do a slowdown of a per if you can slow a person down by changing their environment. My parents are definitely slowed down. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's 30 plus years they've yeah. been there, but yeah. yeah that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And then you've got a... And then uh, our David Cho money question. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah, what would you do? Uh, uh, mainly... Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, that okay. will pick up for sure. Yeah. Huh? I think yeah, I mean, we got Bart on one side and then Amtrak on the other. <laughs> so it's a little loud in here. Uh, I think it's gone now, right? Yeah. Uh, I hear a little rumble, but I think it'll be fine, right? The toot's gone. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, it's basically like it, if there's any sort of like uh, outlandish sort of project or any sort of um, dream sort of uh, idea that you, or concept that you might have that Artistic. if money, yeah, if if money wasn't an issue, basically that mm -hmm. you would try and tackle. Yeah, I mean, I've got like a lot of ideas for kind of bigger installation work mm. that I'd like to do, but none of those are like cho money kind of things. <laughs> yeah, but if I got like blessed with a huge chunk like that. Uh -huh. I think what I would really want to do is find a space here in Oakland, buy it and like create uh, something similar to Minnesota street projects mm -hmm. in, in San Francisco where it's like a large building that contains both studio space, gallery space, and, you know, maybe there's some kind of art nonprofit that's also headquartered there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right on. Um, because I feel like it's, it's honestly fucked. Like the, the situation here with gallery spaces and the rising costs of rentals and everything is oh. getting really, really hard. Oh, and like yeah. such a familiar story. Yeah, and galleries so, are closing up, and yeah, and without that, like I feel like it really stifles the development of an art scene. Mm -hmm. Like I think you oh, see yeah. this trend towards huge group shows. Mm -hmm. You don't see galleries doing solo shows anymore, mm -hmm. and so artists aren't really developing their own voice or right. developing a coherent body of work. We're trying to make idea. hits, not not an album. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that's really limiting in terms of how an art scene can develop. Um, right. And just not having spaces. Seeing how much things have changed in the past three or four years, especially in the wake of the ghost ship fire, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you had this major crackdown happening. The art community here does not have places to meet and come together anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really been very harmful. Mm -hmm. And so, like, what I would want to do is just, like, take that money and get a physical space and that's own awesome. it and hold it down and be like, mm -hmm. you can 
do whatever the fuck you want around here, but this is our space for right. us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that's so important. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, I think we're pretty much done with questioning you. Cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, if anyone wants to find you, uh, your Instagram is Slow Cool Salt. Yes. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was worried I was going to get that wrong. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm the only David Polka out there making art. So <laughs> right. yeah. That's good. Just yeah. Google me. <laughs> first thing that comes up. For sure. Yeah. Uh, definitely check out his work. It's, I mean, I'm a fan. I love your work. Uh, and uh, I don't know about Sergio. I'm just <laughs> So uh, you're a recent find for me, but yeah, yeah. I've gotten into a lot right? uh, awesome. lately. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank uh, you. I really appreciate it. Uh, this has been Waiting Dry. If you're still listening, fuck off. <laughs>